Good morning. We're building on the basics. We've been going through the Paul's letter to the Romans, and in this letter, Paul lays out fundamental Christian truths, truths that we're to build on. The first 11 chapters of Romans lays out the foundation of faith, the substructure of faith. And then the beginning in chapter 12, Paul builds on the foundation and starts to erect the superstructure or the visible things. Faith is the foundation. And then we build on that faith. Um, It's the pattern in Paul's writings. He tells us what to believe. Then he tells us how to behave. So in chapters 1 through 11, Paul lays out what we're supposed to believe, and he takes a long time in doing so. Then he comes to chapter 12 and tells us how to behave. Um, The goal of the Christian life is to express faith through love. Paul begins in chapter 12 with faith, and we'll remind ourselves of what he tells us to place our faith in. And then he moves towards love, how we're to behave. Let's talk about the what of love. When we talk about love biblically, what does love mean when we find it in the Bible? Love means a lot of different things to a lot of different people. And biblically, we're going to try to nail down what it means when the Bible talks about it. Uh, It says in Romans 12, 1 and 2, it's not in your worship folder. We looked at it last week. Let me just read this for you. (coughs) Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. Paul writes, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers. Again, as he's laid the foundation and now he's building on it. And he reminds us of what he's built the foundation upon. That's what he says. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. As Paul brings the faith section of this letter to a close, what he identifies as that which we root our faith in is the mercies of God. Um, faith must be rooted in mercy, and Jesus lets us know what mercy-based love is like. Love means a lot of things, but biblically, love is rooted in mercy. And Jesus is the first one to let us know what love that is rooted in mercy is like. And that's what we got to be clear about when we think about the what of love. Look what it says in your worship folder. It's written down Luke 6, 32 through 36. Here's what Jesus says. If you love those who love you, what benefit is that to you? For even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good to those who do good to you, what benefit is that to you? For even sinners do the same. And if you lend to those from whom you expect to receive... What credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners to get back the same amount. But love your enemies and do good and lend, expecting nothing in return. And your reward will be great. And you will be sons and daughters of the Most High. For he is kind to the ungrateful and the evil. Be merciful, even as your father is merciful. It suggests that merciful love is expressed in kindness, even to the ungrateful and to the evil. God wants us to express our faith in this kind of love, in merciful love. And if we draw a distinction between what human love tends to be and what divine love tends to be. Human love tends to be narrow and shallow. We love those with whom we're comfortable to a not very deep degree, perhaps, 
in comparison with divine love, which is deep and wide. Human love tends to be narrow and shallow, and divine love is deep and wide. And let's think about deep love and wide love. Merciful love is deep love. And Paul writes a couple things that let us know some of the characteristics of deep love. First, it says, let love be genuine. That means non-hypocritical. So it's not just skin deep. When it's real love, deep love, you don't just say the right thing. You believe the right thing deep down and you express it. Sometimes love can look nice, but not be nice under the surface. It's, oh, nice to see you. Not. <laughs> and, but that's hypocritical. We deal with that. And what we're going to describe, the love the Bible describes, by the way, we're going to describe it. But I'll tell you what we're not going to do. I'm not going to tell you a bunch of nice stories so that you can generate this kind of love. This love is very challenging. So if you're thinking, you know, Mike, I'm not real good at that. I got you drift. And so that's why at the end, we're going to have to talk about the what of love, but then talk about the how. And it's not going to be because we tell nice stories and we get inspired and we go out and we're going to love like this. This is very challenging love. But let's at least register what the Bible means when it says love one another. Um, Merciful love is deep love. It's non-hypocritical. It's also principled. It says in verse 9, abhor what is evil. Hold fast to what is good. When Jesus loved, he loved enough to move towards people and even risk offending them in order to move them to the place where they could connect with God. So he was willing to put himself at odds with people in order to do for them what they really needed to be done. And they might not have appreciated that. Uh, And we'll reference, we actually did a series once in a book called Bold Love, which the premise of it is very fascinating. Um, It is this, it's on the jacket. It says, if Jesus had loved with the definition of love that we tend to embrace, he would have lived to have been a ripe old age. What you think about that? He died young. You know why he died young? Because he loved well and he loved deeply. And he loved deeply enough that he was willing to say things to people that they needed to hear that was expressed lovingly, but then offended them. Bold love is not always nice. And that's what Paul suggests here. Abhor what is evil, cleave to what is good. Love enough for your love to be principal. Um, love is passionate. It says love one another with brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Outdo one another in showing honor means lead the way. And if there's somebody that's going to stand for reflecting towards others, honor, being one who points out and encourages other. Lead the way. That's what Paul says. Um, It says in verse 11, do not be slothful in zeal. Be fervent in spirit. Be fervent really means to be burning, bubbling, boiling. It's to have that sense. Love is not lazy. It's intense. Uh, It says, rejoice in hope, be patient in tribulation, be constant in prayer. Love is passionate, it's also practical. Verse 13, contribute to the needs of the saints and seek to show hospitality. Let love be expressed practically. When you can meet a physical need, meet it. James talks about that, so does John. If somebody's in need and you say to your brother, go be (laughs) well-fed, That's not love. We know what love is because God, when he loves, rolls up his sleeves and he enters into the world. He doesn't love from a distance. He loves up close and at cost. And what the Bible tells us about is that's what we are to aspire to. Again, this is if you're hearing, and especially when it's going to add some things in terms of the width of love, that's going to be even more challenging. Um, In fact, what is his merciful love is deep and wide. 
deep. It's talked about some of the things. It's passionate. It's practical. It's principled. Wide love. Jesus revealed that God, and this is how he expresses mercy, is kind to the ungrateful and the evil. In order to be merciful, even as your father is merciful, love needs to include those to whom it is not naturally expressed. And again, it's an understatement to say that it's difficult to love an enemy. But that is what God does. He is kind to the ungrateful and to the evil. And to be merciful as our Father in heaven is merciful means that our love is to be both deep and wide, encompassing those that love doesn't normally encompass. This is what distinguishes divine and human love. It enfolds the enemy and the persecutor. And again, this is extremely challenging. Paul describes this kind of love. Here's what he says. Look at verse 14. Bless those who persecute you. Try to make some room for that. Really, just try to think about that. Bless those who persecute you. (laughs) Bless and do not curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Never be wise in your own sight. Love is not evidenced by arrogance or by vengeance. And he goes on to identify and really put the focus on taking revenge. Look what he says in in verse 17. Repay no one evil for evil, but give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of all, if possible. So far as it depends on you, Live peaceably with all. Beloved, never avenge yourselves. But leave it to the wrath of God, for it is written, Vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. To the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. For by so doing... You will heap burning coals on his head. We have to talk about that. You get the image, maybe, and it's not what the image is. You know those things where they sometimes have those things when you have a charcoal briquettes, you know, like a thing, you put them in that. There's a, a little holder that you, that you get the briquettes hot, and then you put it in this thing, and then you dump the briquettes out into the thing, and then you can... Everything starts. So it's, it, what it's not saying is to get your enemy and to get one of these things of flaming briquettes. And I'm just being biblical here. You know, tss, you know don't do that. Don't put that on his head as a hat. Um, not what it's saying. Um, we'll talk about what it means. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Um, in the Magnificent Defeat, there's a quote. It talks about how the world responds to the different kinds of love that exist. Let me read this. It's pretty short. The love for equals is a human thing. A friend for friend, brother for brother. It is to love what is loving and lovely. The world smiles. The love love for the less fortunate is a beautiful thing. The love for those who suffer, for those who are poor, the sick, the failures, the unlovely. This is compassion. It touches the heart of the world. The love for the more fortunate is a rare thing. To love those who succeed where we fail. To rejoice without envy with those who rejoice. The love of the poor for the rich, the black man for the white man. The world is always bewildered by its saints. And then there is the love for the enemy. 
the love for the one who does not love you, but mocks, threatens, and inflicts pain. The tortured's love for the torturer. This is God's love. It conquers the world. Before we apply this to ourselves and think about loving and a love that's deep and wide, what I want us to do is, is I think I've told you about this before, um, whenever I think of things like this and think about love and what we're to do when it says this is the kind of love that God does, my instinctive reaction is to take the focus off of thinking that God is like this and let it fall to me. You know, so I am not good at loving the unlovely, and I am not good at loving the ungrateful, and, and, and that's where my focus tends to fall. And I remember once I told you this, that um, there was a sense that I was doing the same thing. I was reading this book on the attributes of God. I think it was Knowing God by J.I. Packer, and it was talking about God's love. Um, and doing that, and what occurred to me, don't look down. Just think about the fact that as you're reading about these things, this is what God is like. And I love for me, I love, and if I'm going to love this way, I'm going to break a sweat. I can't do this. God does this without breaking a sweat. To love like this is natural for him. He doesn't have to fight himself to love the ungrateful and the evil. It's, he doesn't have to contend with himself. He doesn't have to contend with what we have to contend with. You know, the frism, rism, frism, rism, rism. God doesn't have to do that. He's free to love who he chooses. And he loves those whom we might feel he is challenged to love, but he's not. So here's what I'm saying. God excels at loving. And it's not hard for him at all. That's the kind of person you want to worship. That's the kind of person you want to serve. The one who doesn't have to struggle. We struggle to love. He doesn't. Let's go on, though, to think about this is what he wants us to act like. Um, in order to love like he does, one thing it says that we're to put the crosshairs on and try to resist is to avenge ourselves. When somebody does something, they, they take your promotion. They do something deliberately mean. It's not a, it's not a mistake. They did it on purpose did something to provoke. And the sense is, I got to even the score. You know, this person did that tit for tat, eye for an eye. Isn't that biblical? Eye for an eye? You know, he took an eye, I take an eye. Apparently, on this side of the cross, Jesus models what love is like. And it's not eye for an eye. It's not taking revenge. It says, do not be overcome by evil but overcome evil with good. We know what this means. It means that revenge doesn't balance the scales. We tend to think, okay, you did this, I did that, the scales balance. And what it's suggesting here is when somebody does something and you do something in return, it's not one to one, it's evil to good zero. Avenge, that's we're not to do that. Um, retaliation doesn't even the score. Reacting causes evil to run up the score. It says never avenge yourselves. But leave it to the wrath of God, for it is written, Vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. It's not that justice is not indicated. It is indicated, perhaps. It's not your job. It's his. It's his job to balance the scale. He's the one that's going to cause everything to be balanced in his time. Not our time. Understanding that is part of what we need to be aware of in order to revoke our revenge. There's things that we feel need to be paid back. And again, we don't know how God balances the scales, but he will do so. And what it's saying 
Leave room for that. Leave room for that. Um, there was a story about a farmer agnostic who wrote this letter to the editor of a local paper. Um, the editor was a Christian, and this guy just loved to just give it to him. And he knew he was a Christian, wanted to be irritating, so he wrote this letter. In defiance of your God, <laughs> I plowed my fields this year on Sunday. And this person, the editor, felt like this is the way he would honor God by not working on Sunday. And so this guy really gave it to him and said, okay, I, I plowed my field this year on Sunday. I disked and fertilized them on Sunday. I planted them on a Sunday. I cultivated them on a Sunday. And I reaped them on a Sunday. And that's what he said. This October, I had the biggest crop I ever had. How do you explain that? The editor wrote back, God does not always settle his accounts in October. <laughs> Leave room. Uh, Jesus was treated unfairly. How did he respond? That's what it says in 1 Peter. So you think about how we can do this. How can we do this? For this is a gracious thing. When mindful of God, one endures sorrows while suffering unjustly. For what credit is it if when you sin and are beaten for it, you endure? But if when you do good and suffer for it, you endure, this is a gracious thing in the sight of God. Verse 21, I think this is where your version. For to this you have been called because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example so that you might follow in his steps. He committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. And look what it says, verse 23. When he was reviled, which is revile, you know what revile is, you know, just trash talk, humiliated, insulted, argued with. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When they shook their head at him at the cross, he didn't shake his head back, you'll get yours. When he suffered, he did not threaten. but continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. Jesus didn't retaliate. It's important, though, to understand. And this is a double negative, and I'll make it a positive. He didn't do nothing, though. He didn't retaliate, but that's not to say that he did nothing. What he did he continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. That's not nothing. What Jesus did, he took in what was happening, knew it was unjust, and he understood that there was no court on the planet that was going to be able to grant the justice that he knew needed to happen. So you know what he did? He trusted it to a higher court, to him who judges justly. And the one who judges justly does not sit, again, I'm not blowing up the Supreme Court, but it, it, no, it's his court. And what Jesus did, and this is not nothing, he registered the insults. It's not that he wasn't aware of them. He was aware of being insulted and reviled. What he didn't do, he didn't threaten and revile back. He said, you know what, God, here it is. Here's what they're saying. You take this. You take this. That's not nothing. When somebody does something to you and they unjustly persecute or defraud or swindle, you might take action. There might be some things you do to correct, but to love them. What you do, you appeal it to him first and foremost. You appeal it to him. God, here it is. I, I, don't, I just give this to you. 
And you might uh, just something, if, if some of you have really been defrauded and it's really painful and hard to get by it, maybe somebody did something. Somebody took you to court and it was a settlement that was unfair. You know what you might do? It's just kind of a ceremony kind of thing. I've done this on occasion. Take that thing that represents the injustice and maybe clear a table for a little bit and then take this thing and put it on there. Maybe imagine that you're approaching God's court. Say, God, here it is. Here's the documents. Here's this file. Here's what they're charging me with. I can't fight this. I, and I'm going, and so I, which I remember what Jesus did. He entrusted himself to him who judges justly. So, God, here it is. Will you look at this? And I'm not sure how I can fix this. I don't think I can, but can I give this to you? You will balance the scales. And can I put this on your docket? That's what Jesus did. And that's, what, and that's not nothing, is it? You know what I mean when I say it's not nothing? It, it looks like nothing. You mean you're not going to fight back? And there, there are times, I'm not saying let people get away with things because courts exist for a purpose. You know? so there's, but first and foremost, between you and him, love is predicated upon the hope of justice. And you're not going to get it. It might not come in this lifetime. It will come. God will balance the scales. Maybe not October, but he'll balance the scales. And I think we need to know that. Um, If your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. For by doing so, you will heap burning coals on his head. If your enemy is hungry, feed him. What love is biblically, it's very practical. And it doesn't seem to indicate here that your best friends, uh, come here, nuggies, you know, I know you took it out at me, but hey, I'm supposed to love you in return, and hey, bygones be bygones, come on, come on out of the house, let's eat a meal, you know. Honey, here he is, here's Charlie, the one who just dissed me, yeah, we're going to make a meal for him, you know. Don't. That's, no, it's treat him with common courtesy. If he's in a place where he is in need, without food, without drink, an accident, he falls, there's something you can do. You to extend, we're to extend common courtesy. He doesn't need to be best friends. Um, when it says dump, you put burning coals on his head, um, burning coals is an image of somebody who is to be judged. And so what it is indicating, we can revoke revenge not take revenge, and even extend help to those who we would consider enemies. The reason is because judgment will occur. We don't have to do it. It will happen. So you don't need to believe that this is go unpunished. God will balance the scales. That seems to be what it indicates here. We can trust God to clean up the mess. Um, Scouting, scouring the Bible for individuals who seem to be able to do this. No, Jesus did it. Some of us have a hard time because we think Jesus was so perfect that we really can't relate to him. He did suffer, though, and he does sympathize. However, in looking in the Bible for another figure, uh, Joseph certainly applies. Uh, He's a case study in responding to mistreatment. Look what it says, a couple of verses written out there. Gen- Genesis 37, 3 and 4, says Israel loved Joseph more than any of his other sons because he had been born to him in his old age and he made a richly ornamented robe for him. When his brothers saw that their father loved him more than any of them, they hated him and could not speak a kind word to him. They are going to mistreat Joseph, and they're going to identify it as maybe a reaction to a lousy family life. They had issues with the golden child, you know, the favored one. He got the multicolored coat. I don't have a multicolored coat. And he got, and so it was a clear case of 
preferential treatment and they were, well, incensed. It really is a question, though. What is their problem? They are mad, right? Of course they're mad. Mad. Um, That's what they say mad is. They say mad is the surface problem. It's not the deepest problem. Mad is secondary. Anger is secondary. We kind of push mad to the surface. You know why? Because mad is powerful. Takes charge. Do you know what's underneath mad? And I think what his brothers felt? What they feel? Sad. Sad. Do you know what we do with mad? I think Joseph's brothers did. We use mad to bury sad. It's easier to be mad than sad. We feel vulnerable when we're sad. We feel victimized sometimes when we're sad. It's easier to be mad. Um, the issue is when we use mad to bury sad, it really can take off on us. If we had, if we had approached Joseph's brothers when they were little kids, maybe grown up into adolescence, and told them where their hate would take them, where their resentment would lead them, I would have imagined they would say, no way in the world it's going to lead me there. Um, But it did. Resentment is very powerful. It festers. Somebody, I heard, you've heard this before, I bet you some of you, Resentment is like drinking rat poison and waiting for the rat to die. You know, the rat, the person who... We think about him and... And the resentment really isn't hurting them, is it? It's hurting us. But again, how do you deal with resentment? Again, it's it's not simple. And that's why we've got to look at this guy, Joseph. Because what ends up happening, well, you know what happens. Joseph went after his brothers. I'm just reading. It's not in your thing, but I'll tell you what happened. You know the story. And he found them near Dothan. His dad said, you know, your brothers are out there. Go do something for them. So, okay, they saw him, Joseph, in the distance. And before he reached them, they plotted to kill him. Here comes that dreamer, they said to each other. Come now, let's kill him. Throw him into one of these cisterns and say that a ferocious animal devoured him. Then we'll see what comes of his dreams. (laughs) Resentment had built up over the years. Um, You can use mad to bury sad. You can also use glad to bury sad. Sad is painful. Glad is pleasurable. You know what's also possible to do? To use glad to bury sad. Um, Do things that we didn't imagine we'd do. If you talk to somebody who ends up in the throes of an addiction, what an addiction is, it's a mood altering, it's a relationship with a mood altering substance or experience. And why do we need the mood altering experience or substance? Because it's mood altering. What mood do we need to alter? Sadness. We don't have a large tolerance for sadness, especially in our day. If you're sad, you need to take a pill to get rid of it. It's interesting. Again, I'm not saying be morose, but the ability to touch sadness. Well, let me ask you this. An inability to touch sadness, what would that lead to? An inability to touch sadness. You know, my sense is what that leads to? Being addicted to mad or being addicted to glad. Being addicted to glad. Sexual addiction. Substance addiction. Religious addiction. 
Sometimes church can become a place where we push all the reality out of the way and try to shake ourselves into a happy mood. Um, again, yeah, there's, there's something to be said for that. But here's a question. Do we want to be glad? Or do we need to be glad? Do you know the difference? If we need to be glad, you know what the issue might be? It's not about being glad. You know what our issue is? We can't be sad. Do you need to be, do we need to be mad? Why do we need to be mad? Because we can't be sad. Christianity is not meant to eliminate tension and sadness. Christianity does not exist to eliminate tension and sadness. At some point, you know what our issue is, folks? We're not home yet. And deep within us, there's some tension and sadness. You know what that's rooted in? We're homesick. We're homesick. We want to be in a place where we belong. We want to be in a place that feels finally, and it's not going to be here. And we blame other people that this isn't heaven. And we get mad and we get glad, but at some point we think, as some of us think, that it's unchristian to be sad. If I was a Christian, I wouldn't be sad. Real Christians groan. Mm. Not all the time, but they can touch. Disappointment can touch hurt. It's interesting. What Joseph ends up doing, Genesis 45, he ends up seeing his, his brothers, again, on the far side of all kinds of stuff that he had to continue entrusting himself to him who judges justly. So he's put in prison and he interprets somebody's dream, but they don't remember it. And just one thing after another, after another. Um, here's what he says when he sees his brothers for the first time. And they don't understand who he is yet. Um, he, had effort, he says, um, I am your brother Joseph, the one you sold into Egypt. And now... Listen to this. <laughs> do not be distressed and do not be angry with yourselves for selling me here because it was to save lives that God sent me ahead of you. He does send them on a wild goose chase. You know, he has one of the brothers stay and he sends the rest of them off and he put, plants something in one of their things and he says, go arrest them and he brings them back and he kind of jerking them around a little bit. But you get the sense that he's not jerking them around because it makes himself feel better. He's teaching them a lesson. Um, it's interesting that, and sometimes you hear about this, he had forgiven them, and we're going to talk about how. But he had. But his forgiveness didn't mean he forgot, did it? Somebody said, we heard this, forg forgive and forget. Don't. Don't. He didn't forget. He said, oh, would you do it to me again? I'm just blanking out here. I, I remember that I was going to Dothan, and... Um, I was going to get, dad told me to come and say something to you. And, and that gets a little sketchy at this point. And he threw him in a pit and he, he remembered that. When somebody does something, don't forget it. You can hold on to what happened without holding them hostage. And how do you do that? We'll talk about that. Forgiveness isn't forgetting. Um, forgiving leads to loving. Again, that's what there's a, Here's what bold love, here's what in the book it describes bold love. Here's the, the definition. Bold love is courageously setting aside our personal agenda to move humbly into the world of others with their well-being in view, willing to risk further pain to our souls. So it's moving towards somebody, willing to risk further pain 
if you can put somebody on the path. That's bold love. Bold love. It's not weak. It's, it's courageous. Um, forgiving leads to loving, but forgiving does not always lead to reconciling. What it says biblically, if somebody offends you and if you forgive them, forgive means that you don't hold yourself hostage to their expression of forgiveness. Uh, Lewis Smith says, forgive, to forgive is to set a prisoner free and to discover that the prisoner was you. To forgive is to set somebody free. And it's that what to forgive means, I'll tell you what it means. And we'll talk about it in just a second. I'll tell you what forgiveness means. Forgiveness doesn't always lead to reconciling. If somebody says, hey, listen, man, uh, you know what? I, I really messed up. I, I did this to you. And, and if somebody owns up, then you make room for relationship. You forgive them. But if they own up, then there's a reconciliation. You know, I, you know, I got it there. I understand. If they don't do that, you still treat them with common courtesy. You still help them if you can. But in terms of making a big place in your life for them, don't. You don't reconcile until somebody's willing to be reconciled. It takes two. But you forgive them regardless. You don't wait for them to give you something before you move on with your life. But you don't move back into a relationship until they own their part. That makes sense? Yeah. Um, forgiving leads to loving, not always to reconciling. How was Joseph able to do this? And we're going to zero in. How, how was he able to learn this? I think there's two things. I'm going to read. Just, I... Here's what I did. I typed in, wept, wept, weep, wept, on a concordance. Hit it, pushed, enter, and found the things that were in the end of Genesis 40, where, where Joseph's stuff is. This is what I got. Okay, Genesis 42, 44. Joseph, he turned away from them and began to weep but then turned back and spoke to them again. He had Simeon, Simeon taken from them and bowed before their eyes. Genesis 43, 40. Deeply moved at the sight of his brother, Joseph hurried out and looked for a place to weep. He went into his private room and wept there. Genesis 45, 2. And he wept so loudly that the Egyptians heard him. And Pharaoh's household Earth about it. Genesis 45, 14. Then he threw his arms around his brother Benjamin and wept. And Brenj Benjamin embraced him weeping. And he kissed all his brothers and wept over them. Afterwards, his brothers talked with him. Genesis 46, 29. Joseph had his chariot made ready and went to Goshen to meet his father Israel. As soon as Joseph appeared before him, he threw his arms around his father and wept for a long time. Genesis 51, Joseph threw himself upon his father and wept over him and kissed him. Genesis 50, 17, this is what you are to say to Joseph. I ask you to forgive your brothers the sins and the wrongs they committed in treating you so badly. Now, please forgive the sins of the servants of the God of your father. When their message came to him, Joseph wept. You know what Joseph developed? The ability to grieve the ability to be sad. He didn't live in sadness, but he could touch it. What does it take to be able to be sad? I'm going to suggest something. It's surprising, perhaps. Do you know what it takes to be able to surface sadness? Sympathy. Sympathy surfaces sadness. It's very difficult to touch sadness when you're alone. When you touch sadness alone, it doesn't just feel like sadness. It feels like choking. And <laughs> in order to feel sorrow that doesn't feel so overwhelming, you know what I mean? Some sadness can be just absolutely debilitating. It's more associated with depression and we feel just powerless and awful. There's an ex that feels like an expression, not quite sadness. It's, 
That's something more than that. Sadness is when you're touching something, but you're not touching it alone. Sympathy surfaces sadness. And you can get sympathy a couple of places. You can find somebody who has room for you to talk about what it is you're dealing with. Stay away from somebody who gives you a lot of advice, unless you want it. But if you just want to express sadness, sometimes you want to express sadness and you don't want a lot of advice. I told you about this. There's Joe, Joe Bailey wrote a book, View from a Hearse. His two kids had died in an automobile accident. And he talks about the people who came to visit him. And some came and, and said things like, well, God has chosen you for a really important mission. And he really thought you were big enough to visit this thing upon you. And he couldn't wait for the person to leave. Go. He didn't say that, but he wanted it to. Another person came and, and read from the Psalms about the birds that sing and the flowers that smell nice. And, and then he says, the person came, sat quietly, prayed simply and left. And he said, I hated to see them go. Find somebody who can just sit with you so you don't have to be alone in your sadness. The sympathy of somebody else can help us to touch sadness, and which brings us to, we do not have a high priest who is enabled to sympathize with your weaknesses. One of the things we will learn, and our learning will continue to learn, Jesus' sympathy is real. It's possible over time to develop an increased ability to experience Jesus' sympathy. It's possible. We'll talk about Jesus and talk about his commitments because if you believe he's judging you, you can't get sympathy from someone who's judging you. Just not possible. Just isn't possible. We need to be able to touch sadness because the inability is where mad comes from and where glad addiction comes from. So we got to be able to touch the sad. You know what I mean? And you know what it takes to touch the sad? Sympathy. Sympathy surfaces sadness, enables us to touch it. In fact, one of the reasons why many of us have a hard time with sad is that there wasn't room for sad growing up. I'll give you something to cry about. <laughs> and again, and parents heard that, who heard that from their parents. Who were, it's hard for us to make room for sad. It's not hard for Jesus. He's a man of sorrows and one acquainted with grief. And like one from whom men hide their face. One of the things you're going to find as you become more aware of God's commitments and you have a picture of Jesus and understand that he felt things, he experienced things, you will be able to dial in his sympathy. And even when you're alone, you'll feel less alone. Really. Really. And sometimes I think about things, and I, I think for all of us it's challenging. We don't do sad very well. And it would be good for us to be able to touch sadness. In fact, what I'm going to recommend, an ability to touch hurt and hope at the same time. Touch hurt and touch hope. What happens if you touch hurt without touching hope? What happens if you touch hope without touching hurt? How are you doing? Great. Let love be without hypocrisy. If we touch hurt and hope. That's, um, that's what it says about Jesus. During the days of Jesus' life on earth, he offered up prayers and petitions with loud cries and tears to, to the one who could save him from death. Jesus offered up prayers and petitions with loud cries and tears. Some of us don't cry, and I'm not saying cry a bunch. Some of us don't do that. Some of us are very emotive. Some of us are not. The Jewish race is genuine, gener is pretty emotive. The Middle Eastern, that's, that's kind of the culture. It's very emotive. Um, some of us don't express it all that much. But what we know is Jesus got sad. He felt it, expressed it, because he knew the Father was. The second reason that Joseph did, and we'll end with this, um, he could
could see that God's good trumped his brother's bad. Look what it says, the last verse, Genesis 50. Joseph said to them, don't be afraid. Am I in the place of God? You intended to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. Do you know what Joseph did? And the reason why he could forgive his brothers, he looked around at people eating. He knew that he had been sent to Egypt. And what he could see is because of his administrative presence, that there were stock houses of grain in the midst of a famine. And he looked at his brothers and what they did, and they meant evil. And he looked around at people who were eating, and this is what he did. I forgive you because his good trumped your bad. His good trumped you're bad. And so he understood that he wasn't limited by what he did. God's good trumps their bad. I don't know who them is for you. It might be an individual. It might be a number of individuals. They intended it for evil, but God intends it for good. God causes things, things to work together for good. God causes blank things to work together for good. God causes, and we're going to fill it. God causes things to work together for good. God causes what? You know what all means in the Greek? All. (laughs) Yeah. God causes all things to work together for good. And you know what you do? You touch the hurt. That hurt, I didn't like the way that felt. I don't like what the person said. I don't like what I experienced. I don't like the memories. I don't like the feelings I get when I think of the memories. I don't like the way it feels. That's fine. It's just expressing. But you say you cause all things to work together for good. You hold on to the hurt and you hold on to the hope and you get through today. You trust him to help you get through today. And guess what happens tomorrow? If you need to, you touch the hurt, you touch the hope, and you get through tomorrow, and you get through a day at a time until we get to the place where the scales balance and we're in his presence. In fact, come on, we'll have a closing song. Let me pray for us. Father, thank you for um, your purposes and your promises that we can touch hurt and touch hope and you walk with us through this life till we get to the next. And there's no sadness or sorrow there. There's no crying or pain there. Then we'll have arrived. We'll be in the place that we've always imagined we could be. But until that time, walk with us and help us continue to be the people you would have us to be. And as we get to sit down, those of us who have the chance to be able to stay, thanks for the time, for the the food that's prepared, and for the opportunity to share it together. In Jesus' name, amen.